morning. Welcome to the Awake Sleep Apnea Meeting. My name is Kim McCleary, and it's my honor and privilege to be your master of ceremonies for the day that we'll spend together. Um, I have three tasks in the next few minutes, and in homage to the Washington Capitals who took the Stanley Cup last night in an exciting game five, um, I've got three O's for you, for Ovi Ovechkin, our uh, team captain. And those three O's are, I'm gonna orient you to the audience, I'm gonna help describe the objective that we have here today, and I'm gonna give you an overview of what to expect as we're spending this Friday together. First, the audience. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you that are here in the room with us in College Park, Maryland today. We have about 100 people we're expecting, and we invite the patients and family members and caregivers of people living with sleep apnea to sit at the tables with the white tablecloth so that we can involve you in this conversation that we're gonna have across the day. In addition to patients and family members, we have a number of staff from the Food and Drug Administration. We've got sponsors from life sciences companies, partners from other disease organizations, researchers and clinicians with us. I want to recognize the staff of the American Association, uh, the American Sleep Apnea Association, uh, and the board members that are here. They've hosted this meeting and are being generous and gracious hosts to us today. I also want to recognize our colleagues from the Food and Drug Administration. This meeting is put on in collaboration with the FDA, and we're very excited that today is a new opportunity to bring both staff from the Centers for uh, Drug Evaluation and Research and the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health together in uh, this setting of the available and needed treatments for sleep apnea. Uh, in particular, I want to recognize uh, Megan Achalasani from CEDAR, who has led us through this planning process and made it smooth. Uh, and really guided this whole series of meetings that FDA has put on to hear more directly from patients. And we'll talk about the objective of the meeting in a moment. I also want to recognize colleagues from the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, who themselves have done a number of activities to make sure that patient perspectives are included in uh, decision making about medical devices and testing equipment. And all of you as sleep apnea patients have a lot of interface with medical devices. We all do in our everyday lives, but in particular, your treatment often relies on, on medical devices being safe and effective for their use. Uh, in addition to the audience here in the room, we have about 400 people who've registered to attend by webcast, and we're also broadcasting this meeting live on Facebook, and I think it's the first PFDD meeting uh, broadcast live on Facebook. So that's exciting. So welcome to the folks who are here uh, virtually at the meeting. Now our purpose and objective for today is to advance patient-centered treatment and care of sleep apnea. And this has been a process that's been really gaining a lot of steam and energy uh, and momentum over the past several years. FDA started this series of meetings back in 2013, just almost exactly five years ago, and it has really picked up uh, a lot of um, interest and participation from diseases uh, that span the gamut from rare conditions to prevalent ones like we're here today to talk about. Um, the information that we hear today from patients and family members will help shape the FDA's understanding of sleep apnea, as well as people from the life sciences companies that have treatments in this space and innovators who are thinking about how they can help to improve your lives. Your information will give them uh, new perspectives on what matters most to you in your care, what targets might be important in terms of uh, improving symptoms and providing better relief, the uh, symptoms that pose the greatest challenges for you, the burdens of the treatments you already have access to, and what challenges you face in getting maximal benefits from things that uh, you're using to manage your condition. As I mentioned, this is the 40th, about the 40th in a series of meetings that FDA's been having over five years. 
And uh, as I said earlier, it's the first where we've brought together staff actively participating from two different centers within the FDA. Now, finally, the overview of the day. We have uh, really split it into two different conversations that will all join up because it's really hard to separate the experience of your lives into neat buckets. But we want to spend the morning thinking about what sleep apnea is, the symptoms that you experience, the impact of those symptoms on your daily lives, the challenges you faced in getting diagnosed and, and recognizing uh, that you had sleep apnea. And then in the afternoon, after the lunch break, we'll come back and talk about the ways that you're going about trying to treat sleep apnea. And that includes things that would go through the FDA as part of uh, you know, medical product approvals, and it also includes things like prayer and physical activity and behavioral uh, lifestyle changes that you've made. Um, so we're really trying to be all-inclusive about all of the things that you're doing to try to manage your condition. We'll wrap up the day with uh, some comments from Katie O'Callaghan from the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, and then finally Adam Amder and Carl Stepnowski from the American Sleep Apnea Association will give us some parting comments about how they'll use this information to uh, be even stronger advocates for you in your lives. It's um, now my pleasure to turn the mic over to Adam Amder, who is the Chief Patient Officer for the American Sleep Apnea Association. And really, it's Adam and uh, Will Headpole, who's also here from the board, that have taken this organization over the last five years and made it the patient-centered um, advocate for people living with sleep apnea that it is today. So Adam, please share your story and some thoughts about the meeting and how it benefits ASAA. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Hopefully everybody had a good night's sleep. Uh, I know we're in the Beltway area and I'm sure a lot of you guys are uh, still shaking off the cobwebs from last night's uh, victorious cab, uh, Caps game. Um, this is a very special and monumental day for our community, our community of communities, in that this is the first time that the FDA is looking at sleep apnea, not just from a device perspective, but also from a pharmacological perspective. Nobody just uses one device or uses one drug. Uh, we all have different comorbidities and co-occurring conditions that we're trying to manage. Um, what we've learned is throughout our life, in, in retrospect, is that if you don't have the sleep under control, you don't have the whole story. You're sort of like wag the dog. You're sort of chasing your tail. Um, with that being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors for helping us put this on. I'd like to thank the regulators for, for letting us, allowing us to give us this forum, this public forum to have this kind of meeting, uh, to give our patient testimonials, um, to hear us out. Um, I think you'll hear today the good successful stories and outcomes, you're gonna hear some of the bad, and I think you're gonna hear a lot of the ugly uh, as far as the gray area and a lot of the obstructions and barriers uh, for a lot of clinical pro aspects to this disease. Um, I am not only a patient, I am a son of a patient, I am a brother of a patient, I'm a father of a patient, and I'm a husband of a patient. Um, and with that being said, I was diagnosed at 35 years old I stopped breathing about 150 times an hour. Uh, fell asleep at the wheel when I was about 27 years old at 60 miles an hour and drove through a gas station, missed the light pole, and I was young and skinny. I did not have this beautiful belly that I've uh, earned with, <laughs> with privilege over the years. Um, but the bottom line is this is a disease that the stigma has been the obese Caucasian male. And I think what you'll learn from our survey that we've been conducting over the last month and that we'll continue through this, this meeting today is that this, fit, this disease does not discriminate. We have a, a wide variety of cast of characters of patients uh, who've all somehow have made it out on the other side of the end and have really want to give back. And you know, as they tell you on an airplane, you put your mask on first before you help others around you. We could never have been able to even tell our stories or help others until we helped ourselves. It's the antithesis of what most parents think of. Um, 
you always want to help your child first, and I could have never helped my child. And, and the reason I bring this up is since I was diagnosed at 35, um, my wife was kind enough who, to support me and say when our daughter was about two years old that she was having some of the same issues that I had witnessed. And we had enough faith in each other to go start to explore and evaluate it. And we now have the confidence to know that our daughter is 10 years old, uh, is fully healthy, um, is thriving in every which way, physically, mentally, uh, scholastically, uh, socially. And right now, unfortunately, she's the exception and she's not the rule. Um, there's a lot of comorbidities and a lot of issues that we could really start to prevent long term in future generations if we start to look at early recognition amongst children. Uh, my daughter at two years old had stopped breathing 27 times an hour. We used a surgical intervention, which is a classic tonsil and adenoid surgery. Uh, she stopped breathing about 12 times an hour. Uh, we then used an orthodontic um, intervention and we expanded her airway with a rapid palato expander starting at about three and we keep expanding it since children's bones are malleable and you can manipulate the airway. Um, and we also looked at things like her allergies, whether it's environmental or internal with foodborne um, food inflammation, because uh, anything internal also affects your airway and your breathing, which we'll learn more about today. Uh, with, th with that being said, my now 10-year-old daughter is going to her third summer at sleepaway camp, camp uh, with her CPAP machine. Uh, she goes to sleepovers with it, and she'll be the first to tell you at 10 years old that she knows when she doesn't wear it that she's a cranky, moody little child. Uh, she's an only child, <laughs> so she's a little bit spoiled, but, you know, she saved my life, and, and likewise, I hope to help save many other children's lives. Uh, I can't thank my wife, Justine, enough. Uh, I wouldn't be here literally alive today without her. Um, she was my caretaker for a lot of years as I incrementally was going through a decline that I never knew. Uh, this disease has sort of been misnamed and mis misidentified for a long time. It is called sleep apnea, which means to hold your breath, but it really should be called sleep suffocation. And what that means is I literally was sleeping my entire life with somebody putting a pillow over my face and taking it off throughout the entire night and not knowing it. My parents didn't know it. My brothers didn't know it. Uh, my brothers wouldn't even sleep in the same room with me by the time I was five, six years old. And what we're learning through a lot of the surveys is we see a lot of that self-reported type of stories as well. Uh, a patient went to a sleepover at 10 years old and the, 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 the friend's parents had to call his parents and say, you gotta come pick up your child. He's snoring throughout the whole house. That person in, in this particular survey was not diagnosed and treated until about 40 years later. And that amount of damage and, and destruction to his life over that 40 year span is incalculable. It's incalculable on society, it's incalculable on his personal life, on his family life, on his ability to work. Uh, the fact that he made it 40 years as a survivor is, is astonishing enough. Uh, we as sleep apnea patients are survivors. We've, we've learned to really function with what our normal is. I didn't know what a good night's sleep was because I'm considered a severe sleep apnea patient. And I was so severe that in a, in a clinical setting, in a hospital setting, that because of liability issues that I was so severe, they had to treat me right away at my initial sleep study. And fortunately for me, I was one of the lucky ones in that I had a great positive reaction. And that reaction was at 5.36 in the morning, I felt like I had gone back in time and I was literally reborn. My brain felt like it was 10 years old. I drove home as fast as I could. I got to my, saw, came home, knocked on my door, said to my wife, you don't understand, I figured it out. I know what's going on all these years. I know what's wrong with me. I know what's wrong with my dad. Um, but the crazy thing is, and where this, this healthcare system's got, you know, one of the major barriers is that I then had to wait two weeks for the insurance to process to get my machine and to treat. Those were the worst two weeks of my life because I had one good night in 35 years of what good sleep was supposed to be. And because I was in a hospital setting, they treated me. The fact that I was allowed to walk out of a hospital setting without my treatment is unconscionable to me and still is to this day. Um, there are many advocacy issues that we want to discuss and, and, and hope change uh, outcomes for the better for our patients and remove barriers and obstacles. Uh, and I'm sure we will ad identify many of them today. Um, like I said, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, but we're going to talk about 
all the years before diagnosis, and we're going to talk about all the years after. Uh, with that being said, uh, we, are, we have chosen a clinician and not a researcher, but someone who actually looks at patients and touches them every day uh, in a clinical setting, and we've chosen a, a clinician who is triple board certified as primarily an ENT, an allergist, and a sleep doctor. And the reason why we, we, we chose this doctor is we feel it's important not to have myopic lens. If we're not looking at the whole picture, if we're not looking at the anatomical issues of our face, what we're exposed to in the air or in our body, and how that's affecting our sleep on a daily, weekly, annual basis, we don't have the full picture. So there's a, you know, in light of what just happened today, I'm a little bit stunned and shocked that, you know, we just found out that Anthony Bourdain, who I'm sure most of everybody in this room knows the name, uh, took his own life, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but we also know that people who work in the, in the hospitality industry and who work night shift uh, are much more, uh, much more, uh, without the right word, much more susceptible to sort of mental health illnesses. Um, and we don't want to see people hurt themselves. We don't want to see them hurt family members. And I, I could tell you this, I, I didn't know that I had anxiety. I've been, someone put a pillow on my face my entire life. And to get up here and speak, I could never have done if I wasn't wearing my mask. And I could tell you I'm as comfortable and as calm as I've ever been right now because I know we're at a, finally at a point as a patient advocacy association where we can start to tell our stories. Uh, we've been around for about 25 years, um, but we're really a five-year startup. Uh, with the help of Will Hedepol, Rick Gordon, Carl Stepnowski, Teresa Schumard, and a host of a lot of other people that I, I'm sure I'll forget your names and, and not thank you now, uh, we have really done an amazing turnaround for a small little patient advocacy association. And throughout the day, you'll see a lot of the slides recurring and see some of the programs we offer. Um, and we ask you all to please spread the word in this room, online, for our, 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 our virtual audience. We ask you to participate in our surveys. Uh, this information is vital. It's the whole story. It's the truth. It's nothing but the truth. Uh, and there's no bias involved here. All we want to do is be the martyrs and, and help patients so they don't have to go through the struggle that we went through. So with that being said, I'd like to call up Dr. Shelley Burson. And I think Shelly is going to give us an overall overview of what she sees in her clinic every day. <laughs> so, you want to come up here? Okay. Hi, and, and welcome, everyone. And, and thank you all for coming today to um, be honest, to share your frustrations with a disease that is rampant and growing, and um, you guys are the lucky ones who have been diagnosed. Um, and so the good news is that you're in good company, um, and the better news is that there is hope because there are people in this room who are listening, and they're in charge of developing new drugs and devices and ways to help us live better with our disease. Um, the unfortunate thing is that there are probably more people who are undiagnosed out there. And so our job is really to educate ourselves enough so we can find those other people for social responsibility reasons and just for everybody's better health. Um, so if anybody in here is not diagnosed or wonders if you have the problem, um, I challenge you to just go to sleep for the next 10, 15 minutes and we'll know who you are at the end. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite little owls. It says, every night I go to sleep and every morning I realize it was a, a bad idea. Sleep is an unconscious phenomenon. It just happens to us. So we don't realize what's going on to us during sleep. And it's not really fair to even blame a bedmate because sometimes the problems don't even come on for 90 minutes until somebody hits REM sleep. They may be fine. So 
Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who look like this owl, and they come into doctor's offices and they say, Doc, I don't know, something's wrong, but we, we got to work on this. Um, so uh, just a little um, disclaimer about me. So I am a, as Adam said, a solo practitioner, dying solo. <laughs> it's uh, not common anymore. Um, but that gives me a unique position. I am not owned by an insurance company. I don't belong to a healthcare care system. Um, disclaimer, I'm not pharma or device consulting, not yet anyway. <laughs> And so I see it like it is. And in order to be alive as a solo practitioner, you have to offer services that are different and necessary, or things that people want. I do have a unique combination. I'm board certified in ENT and allergy and in sleep, which is not common. But it doesn't mean that those services cannot be found in other communities out in the world. And you just need to create your own team of providers who can help blend your form and function, which was day one in medical school. They taught us every person is built differently and every person works differently. So the job of the doctor is to figure out your anatomy and how your body works and blend it so that you can optimize the health and wellness of the person. My goal for my patients is that middle sleeping owl. As you know, owls are nocturnal, but my goal is that we should be sleeping owls. This picture is unfortunately all too familiar. Um, sleep apnea is a social responsibility problem. It's happening to other people who are hurting us. Um, often it happens it, it, with um, night, high speeds, they say young men, I don't know why they say that, but um, alcohol increases the effects and there are performance lapses when people just ditz out for a few seconds. Became very personal to me when in, I think it was December 2013, I got the news uh, that a friend of mine's brother, Jimmy Ferrara, was thrown from the Metro North train derailment to his death. And I think the speed that the train engineer was going was like 82, and he should have been doing 30, and just flew right off the tracks. And that happened close to home, because I'm in, from Rockland County, and that happened right over in Westchester. So a little personal thing. And I had just, at that time, become board certified in sleep. And I said to my friend Barbara, I'm, I've got to do something, and this is this is what my career is going to do. We're going to find these people. I didn't want to have a complicated slide about what is sleep. It's an unconscious phenomenon. The muscles are relaxed, and the body slows down and goes into different physiology. And just to look at the first two, light sleep, it's called stages one and two. And then the good stuff the restorative and all the better stuff happens during stages three and four. There's slow wave sleep, and my particular favorite stage is REM sleep. That's kind of all that you need to know at this moment. What, does, what is the function of sleep? So there are a lot of theories, and they keep increasing what we know about sleep. And primarily, it's thought to restore the body to detoxify things that have happened during the day. There's this whole um, new theory that came out recently about how things in the brain dilate and then there's this fluid that goes through and washes out all the toxins. That's all happening during good sleep. Body repairs itself, it consolidates memories, and my favorite is, is dreaming. And that's my son when he was a little guy. So what do we have here? But we, this is about sleep apnea. So we'll just spend a few seconds talking about what is an apnea. You guys all know already that apnea is breath holding. The definition of an apnea was kind of arbitrary. But it makes some sense because a normal breath lasts from three to six seconds. So 
if I can just ask all of you to just for a moment take a deep breath, and we're going to experience an apnea. Hold your breath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That was an apnea. However, some people hold their breath for up to a minute. So, what does that do to people? Well, the way I explain it to my patients, it's very simple. If you're not breathing, the air's not coming in, so when the blood gets to your lungs, it's not picking up oxygen, but your blood is then pumping back out into your body, and it's purple instead of red. And over time, purple blood is going to cause the body parts to wear out. So they had to define these events in order to score a sleep test to figure out who's sick and who isn't. And to be a fly on the wall when they figured out those definitions must have been something else. Because it's arbitrary. And I always wanted to know if all of that matters is 10 seconds. But a normal breath is three to six seconds. What about something that's nine and a half seconds? And anybody who's a sleep technician, when I studied for my boards, I sat there and I read the montages and I said, but, wh but what about all these things? They're almosts. Well, they don't count. Okay. So I think there are some people who are almost sick out there that just aren't even getting that data reported upon in their sleep tests. But anyway, so here's, he, these are definitions. There's a thing called an apnea, has to do with your airflow, and it, it, that you're not breathing. It's a 90% drop from your normal breath. And then there are different definitions for hypopneas. If I had to sit for my boards again, I don't think I would pass, because I think they change the definitions again, but they keep changing them. Uh, there's a 30% drop in airflow and a 4% drop in oxygen. There's another definition with a 50% drop in airflow with a 3% oxygen drop. It's a whatever. And then there are these beautiful things that I love. They're called RIRAs. They're respiratory effort-related arousals. So they're not enough to be hypopneas or apneas, but they cause your brain waves to wake up from whatever stage it's in. So they definitely disturb you. So I like it when we can count those because then you can find more patients. Obstructive sleep apnea, they have arbitrarily decided that anything less than five of these events per hour is normal. Then there's five to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and more than 30 events per hour is severe. As Adam shared, he, he, win the, he won the award, badge of honor, What'd you say, a hundred and, there you go. So, not really a badge of honor, he was very sick. Children, um, they're supposed to have perfect sleep, so anything more than one. And they also, in children, look at carbon dioxide levels that build up. But no one's being tested on this slide, so let's move on. I'm a surgeon, and you guys don't see this scene. But when we're in an operating room with an anesthesiologist trying to get a sleep apnea patient to sleep, it's a real struggle. It's not a scene you want to be involved in. And the anesthesiologists are really happy when there's an ear, nose, and throat doctor in the room. Why? Because we know how to do the trach. We know how to bypass all of that upper airway stuff. But it's a challenge. The airways are narrow. They're collapsed. Very often the chin is recessed, and when you give somebody medicine to put them off to sleep, all of the bad stuff with sleep apnea rears its ugly head right in front of you. So medication choices need to be different in sleep apneics, and there's a phenomenon that's called REM rebound, which means that after you've had anesthesia, sedatives, painkillers, a lot of those medicines take your body out of REM. Once all of that stuff has blown out of your body, and it's typically post-operative day three, you are a sitting time bomb. Why? Because the body hates to lose REM, and it comes back with a vengeance. 
very often when somebody's home. And that's when we ENTs get the phone calls about post-op tonsil bleeding or increased pain, and it's been tied directly to this REM rebound. Unfortunately, it's also tied to heart attacks and strokes. So Francis Chung is an anesthesiologist who was very, very um, formative or important in the world of trying to figure out who might have sleep apnea. And she devised a great scale. It's called the stop bang. It's a mnemonic that has three subjective symptoms and four that are objective. And it's unlike the Epworth sleepiness scale that you guys all have done. And the problem we have found as clinicians is that you can't always trust that someone's going to tell you the truth about how tired they are, especially when they're asked do you fall asleep at the wheel. So, and we can't, we can't trust that when we're taking a person to the OR. So this is brilliant. Any combination of five or more positives and then sending a patient for a sleep study, there's a very high chance that you're going to find sleep apnea. So the three things that people cannot tell you the truth about, but we know you're lying. <laughs> Do you snore? Are you tired? Has anybody ever said that you gasp for air? And when I tell you the truth, it just seals the deal. Hypertension, you gotta ask in three ways. Do you have it? Are you on a pill that is used to treat hypertension? Or did we measure it high today? And by the way, the definition of hypertension has changed. It's no longer 140 over 90. It's 135 over 85, and there's some talk about some people use 130 over 80. So we're looking at that. BMI stands for body mass index. It's how obese people are. And it says greater than 35 here. I actually use the cutoff at 30 because that's the first class of obesity. Age, we get a point for being over 50. Neck measurement, that's one of my favorite things. I have my medical staff, do, my medical assistant do this. They, we take out a tape measure and we measure a person's neck. Men who have a 17 inch neck has a higher chance of having sleep apnea and women greater than 15. And it's a polite way because it's already out to see how thick somebody's neck might be. And men get an extra point, but I think that, you know, <laughs> plenty of women sitting here. A lot of women have sleep apnea. Anyway, and then I added this other, and then the pear, the apple shape of the body versus the pear shape. Apple shape is higher chances of having sleep apnea. I added this other mnemonic. I call it pizza. And this helps me as a clinician to get the CPT codes to allow the insurance companies to pay for the sleep tests that I want to do, especially in a skinny person who doesn't have obvious sleep apnea to their criterion. This helps me hit the criterion on behalf of the patients. P, P, P frequency, how often do you go to the bathroom? Almost every one of these has a diagnosis code. And it also, by the way, helps me educate the patient as I'm going through the list to tie together these symptoms that they may not have even known had something to do with sleep apnea. How frequently do you get up to pee? Is pain keeping you awake? Parents, it's, it's, it's hereditary. Um, pills, are you taking pills to help yourself fall asleep? Pulse, uh, that get, gets the whole AFib story there. There's a big tie between atrial fibrillation and sleep apnea. Eyes, glaucoma and cataract. Indigestion, nocturnal GERD, reflux. Insulin, diabetes is tied to it. Insomnia, trouble falling and staying asleep. Irritable, there's the mood thing that we were talking about before. T, TMJ, a lot of people grind their teeth just to open their airway. Timing of work, we talked about that. The night shift worker, much higher chances of sleep apnea. Traveling to different time zones. Z, the need to take naps, bizarre dreams, kicking your legs, and then some of the newer things we were already mentioned, allergies, addictions like needing to have caffeine and sugar, car accidents, have you had them? And the apple shape that we just talked about. So yes, I tried to get a sleep study myself, and this is how beautiful we look. Um, I wanted to be humbled and I wanted to know what it felt like, and that goop in my hair was awful the next morning. That was terrible. And um, to be determined whether I was positive, all right, I'll tell you. I had mild sleep apnea myself. Um, I had severe during REM, but I had an AHI of six. So now you have it. I look at sleep as a symphony of the mind and the body. It's really cool. The body is doing a dance. It's all of its parts together and um, just coordinating. 
And when things don't all happen at the right time, that's when we're sick. And the brain is the um, leader of all of this. And by the way, that, that other slide, if I could just go back for a second. Um, it's not letting me, there we go. That's Brahms' lullaby, and I don't know if anybody's a musician here, but in the, if you can see the bass line on the second from the bottom, if um, uh, Brahms was brilliant because the shape of that arpeggio on the lower, uh, on the bass line, actually looks exactly like slow wave sleep. So, which is fascinating because babies go right into slow wave sleep with delta waves. So I thought that was really cool as a musician to pick up on that. So anyway, the brain is in charge of coordinating all of the body parts. The AHI, you guys have heard, excuse me, you've heard of this number and, and this was you know, the badge of honor, the average number of episodes that you have per hour of, of sleep. The RDI adds the RERAs and, and not to bore you. But my point here is that not only do the number of episodes of apneas that people have matter, but when they occur matters. And my big thing is if they're happening concentrated during REM sleep specifically, the physiology is going nuts. The heart is pumping and the oxygen's dropping and the body is doing all this activity. It's, it's very, very... Um, stressful. And if you have 30 events of apneas spread out over the night, your AHI could be five. If you have 30 events happening in five hours, your AHI is six. But if you have 30 events that are all happening during one hour of REM sleep, your AHI during that REM is 30. You're sick. So that matters. Your time bomb. So um, REM, this is a picture of it. The top shows the eyeballs moving. It's a beautiful sine wave. Uh, you probably have held a baby who's sleeping and you see their eyes flickering. That's what it's like. And the brain waves are really active. It's indistinguishable from awake. But the third thing that we need to diagnose REM sleep is muscle atonia. The muscles just completely collapse. And obstructive, and I actually, I have a little um, hand model that I do with my patients to show them, and if I, I guess I can do it here, but I show them that the nose, this is an airway, and this is one of your nostrils, and I show them why the form and the function matters more during REM. So if my first finger is, there's the airway, and it's going to get smaller. If I have a blocked nose, and then I have allergies with inflammation, and then I eat kind of bad food, and then I get into the muscle paralysis phase of sleep, boom, my airway is going to collapse. So there are things that can be done to fix anatomy and control inflammation and talk about nutrition so that when you get into REM, it should be fine. You should be able to hold your airway. So these are uh, obstructive events. That's, that's a break. That's an obstruction. And then after that, you can see all the activity that the, everything got jolted. And then if you take respiratory depressants like alcohol and pills and cigarettes, you can take minor events, respiratory depressed, take that nine and a half second event and make it count to 12. Steve Wright, uh, I love this joke, when I woke up in the morning, my girlfriend asked me, did you sleep good? I said, no, I made a few mistakes. And the reason it's funny is because you're not in control of your sleep. You're not consciously able to make the mistakes. They happen. They just happen. The only thing, mistakes you can make are around your sleep. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that they play around with the circadian rhythm where they are not allowing themselves to be awake in the light and asleep in the dark. And animals do it, we all know. And we're turning that around. We're working at the wrong times, and we're messing up our uh, tendency, our natural sleep cycles. So in conclusion this morning, and I will be back later to talk about treatments and stumbling blocks, it's important as a clinician and as a patient to know what's going on within your own body, your own anatomy, and what's going on around you, i.e., what is your sleep environment, how do you work? Do you have allergies? What's, what, what are you bombarding yourself with in addition to what anatomy was God-given? So with that, um, I will leave this back to Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burson. So, 
a lot to take in there. Um, I think you can give it back to them. Bef I'm going to invite our first panel to come up and take their seats at the front of the room. And while they're doing that, I'm actually going to involve all of you. We're going to be using throughout the day a polling uh, process so that we can get some quantifiable results and have a little bit of data about who is participating in this meeting, not only the people here in the room, but a way to also involve our webcast audience. And we'll use these uh, questions that are built from the survey that we've been doing to help uh, provide some data, as I said, and also to be a, a discussion point for a discussion that will move around the room. Um, there are two ways for you to participate in the polling, and I'm going to ask Eric to put up the first question. You can go uh, log on to a website on your smartphone or your other device, poll everywhere, slash awake, or you can text um, on your smartphone. And there we go. So we're going to do a fun one uh, that everybody can take part in. Uh, it has nothing to do with the content of the meeting, but just to give you a sense of how you, you work um, your phone or your device to participate in this. So you can see the uh, URL is pollevev.com backslash awake, or you can text awake to the number there, and then you get to choose one of these five answers. So what's your favorite part of the upcoming Fourth of July holiday? Fireworks, picnics, patriotic displays, parades, or just having a day off from work or school? And you can also see the results in the bottom right-hand corner up there to see. Is everybody getting the hang of this? I see people getting their devices out. Usually we say put your devices away and pay attention to the meeting, but this one you get permission to actually have your device out and make use of it. All right, that's a good test case. Let's do a real poll. Eric, can we have the second poll, please? Now, this one is uh, asking a question about your, which of these apply to you? And we'll invite the patients, the family members, the caregivers here with us today to participate in this poll and give us a sense of who is in the room and also who is joining us by webcast so that as we go through the day, we'll have a better sense of everyone's um, you know, relationship to sleep apnea. And after Dr. Burson's talk, Maybe more of us need to move to the tables with the white tablecloths than we might have thought uh, in being patients or suspected patients. Great. So while those results are filling in, we've got this first panel, and we're going to have two panels today. This first group of folks is going to build on uh, Dr. Burson's overview, and they're going to focus on the symptoms of sleep apnea, the impact of those symptoms on their lives, and their journeys to diagnosis. We're really fortunate to have found through the survey outreach that we're doing someone who's very newly diagnosed, and then we have folks who've had a lot longer uh, experience with the condition and managing it. The members of our first panel, and I'm not gonna tell you which ones they are, we've got a former mayor, an MIT valedictorian, a nationally ranked triathlete, an aggressive social worker, and a television industry executive. And they come from really all parts of the country. Um, and we've asked each of them just to share a piece of their journey as a means to kick off the conversation that we'll have over the next hour or so. And they'll forgive me in advance if I give a little sign, like keep, keep moving along so that we can get to the bigger conversation. Um, and first, I'd like to introduce San Juanita Sanchez from uh, McAllen, Texas, San Juan, Texas, the southernmost part of Texas, I understand. This and, is correct. <laughs> yeah, she's going to share a bit of her journey. Then we'll hear from Peter Stein from the upper coast of Maine. Um, Paul Zuccarini from Key Biscayne, Florida, Eugenia Brooks of Brooklyn, New York, and Joelle DeBrow from Los Angeles will wrap us up. So, San Juanita, please. Thank you. I'd like to, first of all, thank you all for the opportunity to share my story, uh, to give a little bit of way of background who I am and where I come from. I am the youngest of 10. I am a first generation in the United States. My parents were immigrants. 
Um, I have, was a migrant worker, and but I did go to school. I, I am a uh, attorney by profession, and I was the mayor of my city for nine years. Uh, I was too busy to ever think there was something wrong. And I can tell you that I've just been diagnosed on March 20th with my first visit with a doctor. Eight days later, I realized that I had been sleeping or having sleep apnea for probably longer than I ever imagined. My mother had a saying, and it was, El sueño es la vida, sleep is life. I didn't realize just how true that was until I started re learning, and I'm still learning, of how this has affected me and, may, and has affected me definitely and continues. So um, I stopped being mayor, and I thought that maybe my stress level and hypertension had to do with that stress, and I'm sure it did. But I also took time now to start seeing other things that were happening. And as a practicing solo attorney, I'm the one that takes care of all the folks that come in through my office. I start realizing that from the time, and you know how you have a time span, you know, my life before and my life after? Um, mine was uh, not being in, in public service, but having a little bit more time. I start realizing how tired I was feeling. I start realizing that I was starting to sleep while I was doing interviews of my clients, and I didn't realize what I had just told them. Uh, and as a lawyer, that's a scary thought. I started going to court and realizing I couldn't think what the name of that objection was because it wouldn't come to mind. I was driving home and I was at a stoplight and I fell and I actually had a dream and I didn't realize how long I'd been there. I would wake up and it was around February of this year that I, I woke up and I told my family, my sister in particular this morning, I said, I'm dying. And she says, why are you saying this? I said, I don't know. It's this instinct feeling that I have right here is the only thing I could say. I said, I'm dying. There was nothing. I was on um, hypertension medication, and actually my blood pressure started getting normal. Um, but there was still something else going on. And I have a great family that gathers to pray. And I said, this is how it was diagnosed. I was the one at the table asleep during prayer. And I felt, well, it's just because of the mantra and all that kind of just, just sleeping. Didn't realize that I had a, a, a family member who was a doctor. And they took me aside and they said to me, there's something going on. It is not normal how you just sleep. I said, well, it's a Sunday and this is the only time I take naps, which wasn't true because I was starting to come home for lunch and take two-hour naps. I would wake up and have my coffee and I could not go to uh, wake up. I had to sleep for another hour if I really got my day going. And that was affecting my practice because I couldn't stay at the office. And he said to me, we believe that you have sleep apnea. And he began to explain a little bit of what that is. He made my doctor's appointment and he gave me the first monies to make sure I got it done. I did go and what I realized was um, I did a home study and I came back and a couple of days they told me um, uh, the look was, they looked at the monitor and the results of their computer, and they looked at me, and they looked back, and they looked at me, and I realized something's going on. And they said, you're very severe. I had 83 episodes in one hour for an average of 19 seconds. And uh, you need some, we need to do something for you. So they're seeing a, uh, I got scheduled for an overnight study. And I just remember going uh, home after that visit and I was told I was very severe, but I wasn't told what, what else was I going to do. My sleep study uh, overnight was going to be about uh, six weeks later. And as a good lawyer, I went to my computer and I sent a message to my doctor. And I said, okay, you've just diagnosed me. I am very severe, but no one's told me what happens. Can you tell me what we need to do to, to prevent a mishap? Fifteen minutes later, I was called that there was a cancellation and I could come in that night. But how many patients know to do that? How many of I don't know what to ask, and I'm learning here today. I did go in, but the next challenge was because I, unfortunately, do not have insurance. I'm private pay. And I asked when I walked out uh, of that sleep study that I would need a machine. And I said, well, what, what do I need to do to get that? Well, it's gonna, well, the machine that we can give you is the $800 one. And I said, that's the one with the humidifier, because I knew there were some. He said, oh, no, those are more. But the one that you can get is the 800. And I said, okay, well, that means I need to wait a few, a few months, because I got to build up for that. And I just remember thinking, but don't I need that? And it's like, it's available to you, but you have to purchase it. 
And so there was another dilemma walking out, like, how am I going to do this quicker? I said, if I can get a few more wheels to come in, if I can go, you know. You think about what you have to do, but I knew I could get to it. It would just take me a little bit longer. The next thing I know is I, I did ask when I went to my follow-up with the doctor and I asked, is there any other assistance in this? So there's a foundation, a foundation that can allow you to have a machine for $100 and will help you fill, fi file that application. But I had to know to ask. And thank God, it just took a little while to get it, but I got my machine. And it was, it's really incredible that you don't know that you're not sleeping well until you do sleep well. Because I had a different normal. And once I started sleeping well, um, the next day I was able to f not nap. I was able to talk to my family. I was able to sit through an entire interview of a client without watching them look at me like, what is going on? And I am still trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to ask. My next follow-up with my doctor is not until July. So... Um, it's those long gaps between us getting the attention that we need that I do worry. Uh, I worry as a leader in a community with our folks who may not have the financial ability to be able to take care of the situation. And um, I changed my life as soon as I've started learning. I've changed the way that I eat. I am now enrolled in a gym. I'm doing everything possible to help myself stay healthy, but also to be able to provide um, hopefully inspiration to others uh, as I go through this journey, trying to find out what my new normal is going to be and what do I need to do. So um, I continue to learn from a, a fellow panelists and being here, and I hope that this is just the beginning of many series that we can have these dialogues throughout our communities and with people um, who may look at us in the same situation and realize you know, there's something that we need to take care of and something can be done. Thank you. My turn. Um, my name is Peter Stein. Um, I grew up in the Boston area and I currently live in Portland, Maine. Um, I come with a pedigree. I uh, received a PhD from MIT in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in 1986 in the field of underwater sound or sonar system development is actually my forte. And around 1992, I uh, started my own company called Scientific Solutions in, out of Nashua, New Hampshire. Lived there for about 30 years. And, um, you know, it's stressful running a small business, and it's stressful keeping things going, and stressful, and stressful, and stressful. And uh, you grow older. Uh, I met my wife when uh, she was 18 and I was 20. And over the years, she said, you know, you hold your breath when you, when you sleep. You stop breathing. Constantly would tell me that, that you don't, don't sleep well. And then as the years went on, it would get worse. And I think that does, does happen as you get older and things start to relax and so forth. Um, so, you know, we're led to the, to, the, to the disaster of the last year. Um, the company was doing great until around 2000. We were developing technology for the detection of underwater drones in a harbor, which is obviously an important national security uh, of national security interest. Uh, people think about drones in the air. Well, there was one underwater, and they're actually a pretty um, big threat. Um, I pushed hard from about 2000 to, well, from about 2010 to about last year to start a big project. And a year ago, the project was taking hold. And I also got myself involved in some other work trying to save a ski area in northern New England. That's another story. But the bottom line was, is I ended up about a year ago, a little bit more, maybe about 14, 15 months ago, with two full-time jobs and an unbelievable amount of stress and sleepness and so forth. And I believe that the combination of stress and sleep apnea is deadly. What happens is, 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 is simple. It wakes you up. <laughs> you know, eventually you hold your breath. You become mentally ill anyways, and it wakes you up, and it causes you to not fall back asleep. Your mind starts churning again, and you don't sleep. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't sleeping for years, months, and in the end, very little at all. And the mental illness that ensued was, was incredible. You know, I was never a firm believer in mental illness. I'm a believer now. I, my mind was broke. I went manic. It was a clean manic episode. 
I would have these things called that they call micro sleeps. I never knew that a thing called micro sleep was, but I was would be standing there, and I can remember one in front of the kitchen counter, and I'd feel my knees droop. Everything in my body just drooped for a minute. I went to sleep for a microsecond and went to the doctors, you know, started seeing doctors. My, my family was going, you're manic, you need to go see doctors. So you start seeing psychologists and psychiatrists and everybody starts pushing at you and you become more mentally ill. You become more stressful because it feels like your world's collapsing and all of a sudden you're seeing doctors and I'm amazed that the first thing the doctor didn't pull off was sleep apnea. I'm just amazed. They had me starting to go through series of tests. So, you know, the, the world started crumbling apart, and, and I can't, I don't want to go into the details of it, but it was bad enough that my security clearance needed to get pulled. I had a top secret security clearance. The security clearance was pulled because that's the right thing to do when somebody goes mentally ill. You shouldn't be running around with a top secret security clearance. It's fairly justified justifiable and the results of that were everything started collapsing everything started falling apart everything started losing control it was worse and worse and worse until about two months later they had me seeing tests I was literally driving to a stress test that I was late for to try to see if a stress test was causing these micro sleeps when I was on a, a windy road in Maine I came around the corner roughly 60 miles an hour I had been saying to myself you need to stop and take a nap because I would do that frequently I'd always be taking naps you need to stop and take a nap you need to take a nap I didn't stop the next thing I heard was the bang where I had, I had hit a minivan that was also going about 60 miles an hour coming around the other way we just clipped left sides Everybody walked away from that accident. The fireman said, it's rare that I see it come out this good. That woke everybody up. And then they did schedule an emergency sleep study. I think that that's a miserable experience. I'm not sure why, because I think that there's far easier ways to tell whether somebody's you know, holding their breath at night besides having to go through that. I, I described it to people as, it's like sleeping in a tool closet. <laughs> you know? um, and you know, probably it took a while, even after that, to get the machine and the cost of the machine and the pain. They wanted to do it after they said, oh, you have sleep apnea, now you've got to come in and get another, another sleep study so we can set the machine. And I said, why? I have it. Just give me the machine. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it was clear that it's sort of, well, you know, you have to come in. And then I sort of, I, I went in and I actually it was so miserable that I just went home after about, about 20 minutes. And, and, and they said, well, you, you put you on the machine and made it better. I said, what else do we need to know? And I didn't go in, and then I got a call saying the insurance company was going to refuse me, and I went to the doctor, and he gave me the machine finally. You know, it, it, it was an onerous experience to get the machine, the cost of the machines. Um, this is a prevalent disease, and it is linked to mental illness. I can guarantee you. I'm a scientist and an engineer. I base my, my, things on f my, 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 my conclusions on facts and what I see around me, and especially on what I experience. I am so pleased that this is being pulled together, that this is a first of meeting. I implore the people that in DC, that, that, that are with the FDA, that come to DC in order to make a difference. Make a difference. This should be much higher on the list of possibilities of why you're going, why you're nuts, <laughs> why you have a mental illness. Uh, it is now, I'm about 10 months out now of using a machine, and my wife says she's never seen me so calm never know me to be this calm. I'm, I believe in mental illness. I can believe you can be cured from it. I think that this disease plays a significant role in it and in our society. That's my spiel. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Hi. My name is Paul Zuccarini. L listening to the two panelists that spoke before me, I can I can see we all are facing different uh, different challenges with sleep apnea. It, I mean, I'm I'm glad uh, I'm glad that you're you're making progress. That's that's tremendous to hear. Um, you know, it, some people, and and I don't call myself this. Some people might say, you know, I'm tough. I'm not sure what that means since my mother still calls me Polly. So, um, I, I I'm going to start my conversation that. Perhaps I'm subtly different than some sleep apnea patients. I've written a little list down here. You know, I have a, I have a school record in the decathlon, which is a track and field event. Uh, I'm a national champion triathlete. 
Uh, I played collegiate soccer. And I think I bring that type of stuff up to just to let you know that sleep apnea can affect anyone regardless if you're physically fit or not. And then uh, Adam reminded me something last night that uh, people are getting a chuckle out of. I coincidentally can hold my breath for over five minutes. So, you know, I had a, a doctor friend tell me some time ago, said, you know, with sl this sleep apnea, no wonder you can hold your breath so long, you're probably training at night. <laughs> and, 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 and apparently there's merit to it. Now, I'm not sure it's that good for you, but I, you know, I, when we were, uh, when Kim was saying, or, or one of the panelists was saying, hold your breath for, for six seconds, and say, I, I can do that. Um, but what I'm getting to is that it can happen to anyone. And back in 2013, I'm assuming I had sleep apnea well before that, people just kept, whether we going camping or my wife at the time or a girlfriend after my wife uh, was no longer in the picture, uh, kept telling me, I'm, I'm not breathing. I said, ah, I'm it doesn't matter. I'm sorry I'm snoring. I don't want to wake you up. But finally someone convinced me to go to the sleep study, and I can't, I can't ma match uh, Adam's numbers of 150, but they told me 56, and I, I don't know what 56 meant, 56 something. So I think in my case it was fortunate. I got the, uh, the sleep apnea machine right away, and immediately, I mean immediately I felt better, literally that week. So I figure that for years, I guess that was impacting me. So I'm happy about it now. And a lesser, uh, a lesser stage or a lesser situation is that after I got the machine, most recently being that I'm in essentially Miami, Florida, I, I had to deal with a hurricane. So you've got to be prepared. If you've got a sleep apnea machine, you lose power. So if you like to use them and, and it benefits you, be prepared for that. And Adam has some good information on, that he had sent me on everything from battery power to solar powered, but I use my, uh, my battery jumper for my car, it works okay. Um, and then another thing happened, and this, you know, maybe this is not what you're looking for, but you know, as, as a sleep apnea patient, you know, I made a mistake where my condo I live in, the, the termite, the, the tented, uh, tented the building, the entire building for termites, I said, I got everything, except I realized I forgot my sleep apnea machine. And so I can promise you, in my particular case, three days without that machine got me going to 1-800-CPAP or whatever I bought. I had to buy one. That I went to my doctor and said, I need a prescription today. And I, I was stunned how much that three days without it impacted me. So be prepared as you go through your life facing sleep apnea. Be prepared for those type of events. I had a hurricane in one and then my air in another. So it worked out fine, and then uh, the battery, the battery I, I travel with that quite a bit. Um, and the only thing I would complain about, it's not too much, and I think uh, Rick had helped me briefly last night, is that the seal in mine, and maybe I, you know, this is a trivial item, but I'll, I'll deal with it offline, but the seal on my particular mask doesn't work, so maybe I need to be fit with a different one. I appreciate that the opportunity for you all to hear my version of what sleep apnea does for me or to me. Thank you. Okay, five minutes, right? <laughs> all right, I am the oldest of four. Um, coming up in high school, I was a music prodigy. I played piano, blew the trumpet, I was a short distance runner and a hurdler. And two months after my 18th birthday, my mother died from cancer and left me three younger siblings, 11, 10, and five. And I had to figure out on the spot how to grow up really fast and do some very adult things and get it right. And so I would hit the bricks running. I worked all kinds of crazy hours. Um, then when I hit 20, I met someone, I married. Things settled down, got a little easier. Um, had a daughter. Things, life was good for a while, but then at 28, I was a widow. He died from cancer. Back to a single mom, back to working crazy hours, back to working multiple jobs. 
Finally, I got the siblings out of the house and just had my daughter. When she was in high school, I put myself in school. I graduated from community college in May. She graduated from high school in June. And then she went on, thank you, thank you. She went on to college and I went on to further my education. I came out with a master's in public administration with a couple of minors, and I went into social work. I used to jog every day, twice a day. I was into sports, playing softball, all that good stuff. Around 37, 38, I started having all these sinus problems. I kept having bouts of bronchitis, okay? We thought maybe at the time, because I was on the college campus, that, you know, kids <laughs> less than hygienic, that maybe that was contributing to it. The doctor would tell me, you know, kind of watch this, watch that. It got worse instead of better. Um, by the time I was 44, well, well, 43, in 2003, um, one doctor took a look down my throat and said, okay, you got something going on there, all that redness and everything. So they gave me an operation, took out the tonsils, took out the uvula. He said, okay, now you should be straight, go for it. I walked away thinking that was the end of the rainbow. And I was, went for the gusto, I got involved with a new position, okay, and out of nowhere, I started rapid weight gain. I couldn't breathe. I was falling asleep on the job. I was falling asleep behind the wheel. Um, six months later, I sounded like Darth Vader, and I was in the worst physical condition that you could imagine. They had to let me go from my job. I lost my home, my car, everything. I ended up instead of the social worker providing for others, I ended up being in the social system. Finally to find out that the root of the all, all the evil was sleep apnea. That was about 15 years ago. From sleep apnea, I went to degenerative bone disease, AFib and congestive heart failure along with IgA deficiency. This is a bear of a situation. I am no longer functional in a position to work. I live off a disability check that is less than $1,000 a month, and I live in supportive housing. It's a hell of an ending for a fighter and an ambitious person like myself. So I thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. And I plead with you people from the FDA to please do whatever it is you can and everything you can to see to it that no one else's life is ruined the way that mine has been. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Joelle Dubrow, uh, born and raised in California, currently living in Los Angeles, California. I am your television producer and director. Type A personality, oh, you know, work very hard. Normal work week is 60 to 80 hours a week. That's how uh, I lived for 20, 30 years. Push, 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 live, 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 work hard. I was also extreme, uh, physically fit. I danced as a uh, leisure activity, took dance classes, took yoga classes, hiked, spent time outside, walked every day. I was skinny. <laughs> I didn't meet any of the criteria for sleep apnea and I had a horrible time sleeping. Three and four weeks would go by and I wouldn't have slept. Insomnia was, you know, the only way I could describe it for doctors. At the time, I had a Rolls-Royce uh, health plan. They covered everything. We should all be so lucky to have that kind of a plan now. And I was sent from one doctor to another. In fact, here's my list. 
I was sent to a gynecologist because it was hormones, to an ear, nose, and throat because I wasn't breathing right, an allergist because I wasn't breathing right, a neurologist, there had to be something wrong with my brain, an endocrinologist, the endocrinologist theory was that the brain was a gland, and he was with UCLA and he experimented with medication, and to a psychiatrist. I was given pills, 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 and I was a compliant, obedient patient, so I would take whatever I was given for like eight, nine months at a time until I realized I still wasn't sleeping. And I just kind of rebelled. I had enough of these doctors who wanted to treat me with more pills. I always woke up foggy-headed. I was miserable. I was more miserable after the medication than I was during it. The way it affected my life was pretty direct. I had employment issues. I was irritable, uncomfortable. There was a period of time I got fired constantly because I didn't know how bitchy I was. I didn't know how unprepared I was. All I know is that I was groggy, foggy-headed. I wasn't optimum. And I have to indicate that I'm smart. You know, I have multiple degrees. I took all kinds of tests and proved that I'm a functioning normal person when I'm awake. Um, some tragic effects that I did have, at least personally tragic, back in the 70s, I had the chance to direct two pilots. And if you know anything about women and directors back then in the 70s, that was unheard of. Women didn't direct pilots. Only now do you ever hear about that kind of thing, women being behind the camera and directing. I directed two. I couldn't get through them. I was so tired, so exhausted, so cross-eyed. They didn't go. I could barely get them done, and they flopped, and they, the show never went, and I basically didn't get hired as a director thereafter. It was the end of my career as a director, and I continued as a producer and a, an executive in the entertainment industry. Not good. Couldn't fulfill my, my own life and what my goals were. Um, I wasn't diag that, that That journey of looking for doctors took over 20 years. From the time that I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I wasn't diagnosed until I was in my 50s? Yeah, 50s, 60s? Yeah, whoa, back then. So I was diagnosed in 2006. And that was an amazing, interesting thing by itself. I was diagnosed uh, when I was, every time I changed jobs, I also had to change health plans. This one, coincidentally, was an HMO. And they, they sent me home with some sort of a weird machine test, whatever, and decided I had sleep apnea. And then once I had it, they threw me into a room of eight other people so I could get trained on my machine. I was the only woman in the room. Every one of us had a different machine, different mask. They played a video. I fell asleep during the instructional <laughs> video. The people that were the DME, DME people that were walking around that were supposed to wouldn't answer questions. And if they did answer it, they answered it to the men and not me. I had the only machine that, none of, that did make sense. I, none of it. And I, of course, I didn't know. I didn't know where to turn, who to ask questions with. It wasn't until two or three years later that I found out that I was issued a model of machine that was no longer in manufacture, was out of date, sitting on some dusty shelf, and that the DMA company, according to the uh, reviews I eventually read online, was the worst DMA com DME company, that you know, because it didn't help anybody. I also learned later that I needed not just a, a CPAP machine, but I needed one with a humidifier. Then two years later, a machine that had a humidifier that was heated, all of this came in steps, two, three years apart from one another. I went through, just so that you could believe it, I've been diagnosed now and, and a compliant patient for 12 years. I went through 26 different mask styles. I kept a spreadsheet so I wouldn't duplicate it or wouldn't let a doctor duplicate it by accident. I went through seven, I'll call them doctors, <laughs> practitioners who are experts in the field who are the gatekeepers for getting the equipment, the sleep studies, whatever, blah, blah, blah. 
None of them were, in my opinion, particularly competent because I didn't present as a typical patient. My issues and needs were not typical. I'm now with my seventh specialist, Dr. Hashish Patel. Hello, if you're watching out there, Dr. Patel. I told him I'd be here today. He's the only one that actually knows what he was doing. Young guy, under 40. He had no fear of touching the equipment. Every other doctor would not touch the equipment, would not discuss the equipment with me, couldn't answer my questions. None of the DME people. And I, I was with, I think, nine different DME companies. Nine. Because every time I changed a health plan, I had to, or, or when I was between, or you never know. Or I tried another one in hopes it would be better. Nine companies. None of these guys knew what they were doing. It wasn't until I was in a situation where the DME, which was a rotten DME company, but the, the technician also had sleep apnea. And he was a magic, magic thing. Because he had sleep apnea, he told me all these tricks, all these things to do. He said, ask your doctor to give you a prescription for a specific machine with a specific name, blah, blah, blah. He taught me all these things, how to clean it differently, how to do better. I was, it was radical. Everything changed from then. And I've been a compliant patient ever since. Until recently, and I'm going through another episode. I've just been tested two weeks ago. And I don't know my status right now. Machine change, pressure change, who knows what's going to happen. And uh, I would just like this group to realize that how deeply this condition affects all of us. Our lives, our futures, our, pres our pasts. And we all have so much potential. We have oh, so much potential we could be giving more to this world. And I hope that you will all join me in, in making this, uh, this possibility change so that there's better, better treatment for sleep apnea for everyone. So join me in thanking this panel of really compelling stories and witness to uh, the effects of sleep apnea. While you make your way back to your seats so that we can all participate in the, in the discussion session, Eric, let's do another poll. Um, and this one will help us gauge uh, the length of time that uh, our patients and family members have been dealing with the kinds of experiences we just heard so poignantly described um, by our panel members. And We've mentioned a couple times, Adam and I, the survey that we've been doing. We have over uh, 5,000 responses to the survey already, and um, we'll keep that open through the end of June. One of the things is you think about this question, how many years has sleep apnea first affected your life, seems pretty straightforward. But what the open text comments and what we just heard from the, the five patients is that that's a tougher question to answer than you might think. Um, your diagnosis date for many is sort of a point in time. As, um, as San Juanita said, you've got the before and the after, but there's a whole part of the before that probably is clouded by the fact that sleep apnea was a part of that picture. And I think we can see from these results that we have a fairly uh, long-lived uh, experience of sleep apnea here with us today. And we'll keep that open for just another moment. Um, because so many of the stories uh, that we just heard wrapped around the, the very um, arduous process of getting to diagnosis, once you take that step and seek the care, let's have our next poll about how long it took to get diagnosed. And even though these figures are slipping off the screen, we're capturing them. So uh, they're a little bit fleeting in the, in the room here, but we do have this data to go forward. And we'll be able to include it in the report that will be issued uh, later this summer. From the experience we have with now the, the 5,000 plus survey responses, it seems that the process 
you know, once you've recognized the symptom, taken, taken the action to pursue a uh, diagnosis, Joelle had a very long path to finally getting the correct diagnosis. But for others, it seems that um, it, it can happen fairly swiftly, sometimes within weeks or months, as it did with uh, San, Maria, San Juanita, but in other cases, uh, obviously much longer. And now I want to make sure we open this up to the, to the room. Since we've got some polling data here, we've got about 42% are within that first two years, and then the others spread across um, time. Often, and we heard this from Peter and from Adam and others, there is a dramatic event that may prompt you to seek medical care. Is there anyone uh, who wasn't a member of the panel who, who would be willing to share something? It could be the health, your own, in your own health. Uh, I'm going to go to, to Deborah. And we've got some mic runners, I think. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a little Oprah-esque. No, for the, for the purpose of the recording, it helps us for, to have the microphones. Hi, my name is Debbie Paul, and I actually live with recent back of the patients. Yeah, honestly, it's always snoring at my house. But my husband was one of those holding his breath type. I knew it as soon as we started dating, he had sleep apnea, but it took me years to get him in for a sleep study because it didn't apply to him, of course. What actually got him to go into the sleep study is the night he picked me up and threw me across the room in his sleep. Because he had hurt me, then he decided to get the sleep study. Afterwards, once we got that treated, then we found out that he also had parasomnia, which was the violence, and then also somnambulism, which is walking in his sleep. Anyone else want to offer either from a, a family member perspective or their own experience with something dramatic. We found that in about 5% in, in, in the survey, and some of the stories really quite uh, remarkable, uh, including Peter's brush uh, in the car accident. Um, for the caregivers, uh, uh, go ahead. Not that I want to do this, being shy and all, but um, I guess I was a little lucky once. I had surgery. I live in Chicago. Michael Fried, Dr. Michael Friedman has got to be one of the best in the country or world. Um, and he basically said, you need surgery. And what they did exactly, I don't know, something about the turbinates and something about um, deviated septum. So it was better after that, and I was using a CPAP machine, and that made life better. But there's all kinds of twists and turns and wrinkles. I mean, I'm still figuring out jigsaw pieces right now. Um, I didn't know until recently I had parasomnia, which means that everybody else's rim is like muscles offline. Mine are online. Uh, I wake up and you know I've just kicked a soccer ball or swatted off an opponent. And so that sounds to me like there's a sleep interruption because then my brain is supplying a dream which requires me to move, which requires me to breathe. So, you know, uh, as much as I'd like to be the poster boy for go get surgery and it's all good after that, um, it ain't. Uh, it can go on and on. I don't use CPAP right now, and the reason is is because it sounded like Darth Vader, and my wife and I ended up buying literally the kind of baggage airport baggage handler headsets rated to 13, 31 that, you know, so we wouldn't hear each other. And then, of course, every time you move your head on the pillow, you get a creaking sound from the, the never mind. You get the idea. It's like, just you know, you think you, whack-a-mole, you think you've got it swatted down, and then there's another one over here, and it's, and it's, and it makes you feel weird because it's like, well, does everybody have such an interesting life and all these like squirrely little things to keep track of? I mean, am I just like special? I get the whole, you know, full-blown version. So surgery, I recommend, yes, CPAP can be good, um, but there's still other things. Uh, it may be that the best thing will be an oral device I'm being fitted for. That might end up being the best thing yet. 
Paul brings up the range of treatments that uh, people pursue, and that's come up in the panel also. We're going to spend the afternoon focused on, on that part of it and giving particular attention to some of the barriers we've already started to hear about. Um, I'm going to just do a show of hands. We won't do a formal poll. How many people were sent home with a home sleep study before they spent a night uh, in the toolbox? Who called it sleeping in the tool shed? Peter. How many people went home with a, tool, with a home sleep test as part of their diagnostic process? And then how many people were just sent straight to the overnight sleep lab? Yeah. Seems like uh, on the survey response, it was just about half, or 86% actually had the overnight sleep test, and that that was um, the way they got diagnosed. And it sounded like, at least from the panel's experience, that for many people, it, the diagnosis of sleep apnea was a complete surprise. It wasn't something they went in expecting they were going to hear. Show of hands for complete surprise. And the other thing that we heard a lot about is once you had that awareness and the before and the after period, all of these things start to go through your mind about, oh, that was connected, and this is why this feels this way, and here's why my performance on whatever uh, cognitive or physical task is not up to what it used to be. How many have had that experience of feeling this sort of chain of events? And you can go back and maybe, like uh, Joelle, play a, a movie reel in your head of all these things that are connected. Let's talk about that. Let's hear about some of the things that connect back kind of in the retrospective once you've got that awareness that your sleep is so disrupted and disturbed. Who wants to start? Celeste. Well, I am uh, fairly uh, recently diagnosed. I've only known that I've had sleep apnea since 2015. But, uh, but in the last several years, and only because I have felt the same way in the last few years as I felt for all of my life, that I realize that I have always had sleep apnea. I've always had some sort of sleep deprivation that, uh, that changed the way a normal person would feel. I can tell you that I never thought I had a sleep disorder. I felt the way that I felt, but it was normal to feel the way that I felt because of the life that I lived. I was always busy, so yes, I'm always tired. It was normal. Never occurred to me at all that I might have had a sleep disorder. But now that I know that I do, and I'm, just, I'm finally understanding the way that these things are all connected, I understand that the way that I was feeling when I was a child and I was feeling like this was that I was experiencing migraines. Never knew that. As a matter of fact, I've just been diagnosed with migraines in the last couple of years. So I didn't even know that, that I had that. I didn't know that I had uh, diabetes. Been, I, I was diagnosed now several years ago, but I realize now that this was part of the problem. And I can tell you that my parents worked for the city. We have always had good health care. Um, I have always seen doctors and dentists and done the things that I was supposed to do. I was a compliant uh, patient, and I, n I was never diagnosed properly, never. I was never asked if I was ever tired because I was always doing things. I was involved in things. I was a very active child. I was very, I, I was involved in sports, and I was always the leader of something. I was involved in things in my community. I was always the head of something at my church. It was normal to be tired. I didn't realize that I was tired. To be honest with you, I never knew that I was tired. I slept four hours a day. There were long periods of time where I only slept four hours a day, but I never felt any, any differently, and so I never knew that I was tired. This was my normal. This was my normal. So this is how you sleep. This is how you feel when you get enough sleep, and enough sleep for me was four hours a day because when I got six, because I'm a woman, and that's a whole other thing, because we each have an S on our chest. Don't let anyone tell you anything differently. And so 
when you have several things going on, for women, you have several things going on at the t same time. And so just in case those of you who did not realize that we don't get to just sit and watch television. If, there's, if we're sitting in front of the television, there are clothes in the washing machine and a pot on the stove. Because if you're not doing three things at once, come on now, if you're not doing three things at once, you are lazy. There is a problem. So you're always doing something. Your hands are involved in something. Your mind is involved in something. I didn't know that I had migraines. I just knew that there were periods of time that I called fall down or lie down. I didn't know that it was connected to anything medical, honestly. I just figured I, this is just the way that people feel when you do the things that we do. So, you know, periodically you got to sit down or you'll fall down. Because that was just a feeling that came over you after a while. I know now that it's a migraine. Because after a while I would either lie down or fall down. I understand now that I have diabetes and because I, I, I was not diagnosed properly and I was never educated properly, it progressed because I didn't do the things I needed to do and so now I take injections. I have issues with my vision. I developed cataracts and had the cataracts removed and on the suggestion of my uh, eye physician, I had these lenses in, 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 uh, implanted and now, I have injections in my eye once every six weeks. One thing connected to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Things not being properly diagnosed and creating other problems later on. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was really. Celeste's story brings up uh, some data that we've gathered from our survey, and in the, the 2,500 responses that are most similar to at least uh, the group that has participated in the last poll of being maybe longer lived experience with this condition, a bit older, um, longer uh, term since diagnosis, we found that the rates of high blood pressure in that population of 2,500 uh, was about 56% of the people said they had high blood pressure, and that compares with a U.S. estimate of about a third, so much higher. Diabetes was 23% in that group compared to the national uh, estimate for 9%. Uh, for GERD, the um, reflux symptoms, we had 33% of the sample had GERD, and that's about twice what the U.S. population is. And Adam started us off with the reference to major depression being in this population 14%, while in the US as a whole it's slightly uh, under 10%. So much higher rates of all kinds of things that Dr. Burson brought up in her slides. Um, and with all of these layered uh, complexity, Eugenia's story of how one thing just led to this very fast cascade of losing a career, life just falling apart from out from under you. Um, what are some of the other changes of a life derailed by this or by not knowing what it was but experiencing all of the symptoms? I think many of us who consider ourselves to be healthy know what it's like to miss a night of sleep or a couple nights of sleep or a week when we're under high stress. But years and years of not sleeping well, as Shelley said, your blood is being returned to your body in a purple state, not a red state, and it causes chronic um, wear and tear on your system. Anybody want to share maybe some of the, the things, the symptoms they've experienced uh, as a result of this? Yes, please. So I don't have sleep apnea. I have relatives with sleep apnea, but I'm actually here for Narcolepsy Network because we have people who fall in the category of having sleep apnea and narcolepsy. Um, sleep tests for sleep apnea don't necessarily pick up on narcolepsy, particularly the home ones. So we have people who have been diagnosed with one or the other, and they have been good, compliant patients who have, you know, taken their medications or used their CPAP and they're still tired, and they're still having trouble driving, and they're still having trouble in school. Um, I have narcolepsy. I was diagnosed as a teenager in school, so that's the area I always feel when we see kids who are losing 
years, it, there has started to be more recognition of narcolepsy as an adolescent disease, but sleep apnea is something that happens to older adult men. But we have kids who have sleep apnea and narcolepsy. And if you diagnose one and treat one, you're only hitting part of the problem. And so the kid is still falling asleep in school. And they are still failing a grade. They are still losing. They are still sleeping through Algebra 1. And if you sleep through Algebra 1, all the rest of your math classes are harder. So all of that leads to complications, to a life potential that is not fulfilled. Um, and we need to get better at diagnosing the entire spectrum of the problem, whether that is the comorbidity of diabetes and sleep apnea or narcolepsy and sleep apnea. We need to get better tests for kids. We need to get better at the sleep lab because, as somebody said, it's like sleeping in a tool shed. Nobody sleeps well in a sleep lab. Nobody sleeps well during an overnight sleep study. That's why they've started trying to do home sleep studies, but home sleep studies don't pick up on REM abnormalities very well. We need better technology. We need to not have that goop in your hair. I had that the electrodes on your head. I had a full-fledged EEG uh, <laughs> the day before homecoming in ninth grade. Let me tell you, as, as a 14-year-old um, you know, girl, the last thing I wanted to be dealing with right before my first homecoming dance was having all that goop on my head. Oh, it's the 21st century, and as one of our medical advisory board members said, we're still using 1980s technology in our sleep labs. We need to get better at having devices, particularly for kids, that pick up on stuff. And we need devices that are tested on kids, too, and devices that help pick up women. Um, because uh, the default in the medical community is, you know, men, adult men. Um, and we need to get better at that so that people aren't losing years of their lives. Uh, one final comment on mine. I was in denial about the sleep issues even as I was falling asleep on the pediatric neurologist's table, uh, and I was telling him I had no sleep issues. It was the cataplexy that got me into the, the doctor's office because tripping, dropping things, okay, that was abnormal. But I did have sleep issues. One of the things I used to justify it to myself was, well, granddaddy is always resting his eyes. That was normal. Because when you put my grandfather in a lazy boy, he would fall asleep. But granddaddy was always busy. He'd, um, he'd help turn companies around, and he was always hardworking, and he did woodworking, and he had half a dozen things going on. So obviously he didn't have any sleep issues. But as long as I can remember, if you sat him in a comfortable chair, he'd fall asleep even in the middle of conversation. Um, he's in his mid-80s now, and a couple of years ago, he was diagnosed with sleep apnea. Go figure. Uh, so we need to get better at diagnosing everybody, but particularly with, with the um, comorbid conditions. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some of those symptoms that might be prevalent in, in this. Um, Eric, if we could have poll number five up there. Give me the next one. Yeah. yeah, there we go. And we're asking you to let us know the top one or two symptoms that are severe or moderate impact. And by severe, we mean it's a major limitation on your life, and a moderate impact would be some limitation on your life. So think about what are the, the one or two things that most impact uh, your daily life? Give that a minute for people to participate.
All right, good. So it's, it's no surprise that a condition that is sort of centered on sleep and, and poor sleep, that fatigue, daytime sleepiness, uh, unrefreshing sleep often shows up in this list when we did the longer list on, on the survey as being the most highly ranked of the dis disabling symptoms. And uh, the panel met last night for dinner, and we were talking about the difference between fatigue and daytime sleepiness, and can you really tell the difference between those things? And I think people who live with fatiguing, chronically fatiguing condition have all sorts of words and terms they come up with, like tired but wired. Um, you know, I'm sleepy, no, I'm bone tired, I'm exhausted, all of those things might sound the same to a healthy population, but they're very distinct constructs when you're dealing with this and you have to come up with different labels to sort of differentiate between how those things feel. Um, let's talk about fatigue. Uh, it's a tough thing to measure. At almost all of these patient-focused drug development meetings, we spend a lot of time hearing about how fatigue is such a disabling element of everything from different types of cancer, to HIV, to diabetes, to sickle cell disease. It's tough. Uh, it's a tough part of most illness. It's a thing you take for granted when you're well, for sure. Who wants to share the, the impact of the fatigue or the daytime sleepiness? We heard a lot of that from the panel, but I invite others to weigh in as well. So, <coughs> As, as a child, I was always the, the poster boy of why can't you get out of bed? Uh, why are you so smart, but you can't follow through? Um, and that, I never understood it, it was my normal. And then as, as I got into my professional life, my work life, it was the same thing that Joel mentioned talking about directing a co-pilot, uh, pilots in the 70s. I directed a feature film in my young 20s and a week into production, 18 hour days, my brain shut off. And there was no going back, there was no resuscitating it. And it's, you know, fatigue is, the way I explain it is, is as adults, we burn through our adrenals um, so that when I'm tired, even as a 100% compliant patient, I can never, <clears throat> I can go put, go right now up to my room, put on a mask and be asleep within five, 10 minutes. And I had a great night's sleep last night. Um, I don't have the adrenals, whereas children will present sort of as hyperactive. Children still have their adrenals, so at four or five o'clock or that sundown time, that witching hour, that child who's, who's bouncing off the walls or who's climbing on the ceiling, um, it really presents the reverse. And it's not tired, it's not fatigue, but that child is exhausted. We all know it. We know that child needs a nap. We know that child needs to go to sleep, but how do you get them down? Um, so it's an amazing evolution from, from as a child through my teens, I remember starting to drink coffee, by the time I was 13 on the way to school, I'd be in carpool, uh, I'd be snorting myself awake uh, four or five times by the time I got to school. Um, it, was, it was actually interesting. My, my, my mother used to say, uh, even if I went to school late, she'd still want me to go uh, and do an after school activity or a soccer or an event because she knew that the athleticism would help with the anxiety. We, didn't, we never termed it anxiety, she just knew that if I didn't get my yayas out, uh, that was, I was an insane child to deal with when I got home at night. So fatigue is just rampant in all walks of life. Uh, it doesn't discriminate. Um, like I said earlier, I've wrecked more cars than I can count. Um, in hindsight, thank God I never hurt anyone. I didn't hurt myself. Uh, but in, in retrospect, there was no doubt that I was walking through life as a zombie and I had no idea, and you know, I had the aha moment when I did get a good night's sleep, what it was like. Uh, but I could tell you it's not a simple, quick little fix. It's, it's took, you know, I'm now 10 years into my therapy and I'm still learning, and that's a scary thing. So. Yeah, the, the, these fatigue symptoms seem to persist even in uh, the patients who feel like they are well treated with CPAP. And I think that's something we're just now beginning to understand. Um, Shelley, you wanted yes, to add something? Yes, I just wanted to add something. I often confuse the definitions of fatigue and sleepiness, and it's really hard 
to know what the difference is. And so I actually looked them both up because I thought it might come up. And I know that a lot of the new, new drugs or things that narcoleptics are on are meant to treat um, excessive daytime sleepiness. And so just to get the difference, what, and, and again, I looked this one up, but sleepiness, difficulty in maintaining the wakeful state so that the person falls asleep if not kept actively aroused. It's not simply physical tiredness or listlessness. So this is like an urge that you cannot fight. And that's very different from how they define fatigue. So I, uh, and fatigue, they said extreme tiredness, typically resulting from mental or physical exertion or illness. Uh, tiredness, weariness, drowsiness, exhaustion, languor, lethargy. So it seems as if it's like a physical urge that you can't fight to be sleepy. And so I thought that distinction was important because I wonder in your questionnaire whether people actually knew the difference and they just answered it, yeah, I'm sleepy and I'm tired and I'm mm. fatigued. So I, I would question your result there. Mm -hmm. Because okay. I didn't, I, I can't even always keep it straight. Yeah, they track very closely. Correct. So it suggests that people are maybe not distinguishing in the way that they answered the survey. But pharma is apparently Absolutely. dealing with excessive daytime sleepiness, which is that urge to have to fall asleep, which leads you to believe that the mechanism of action is probably somewhere with Different. the whole REM thing. Right. So that's not my We've expertise. Got somebody in the back there who wants to join in. Here. Yeah. Since it came up, um, people with narcolepsy generally say that they, uh, the, your results for fatigue and daytime sleepiness for um, people with a sleep apnea, it tracks the, the consistency of, of the fatigue and the sleepiness. It tracks pretty closely with some of the stuff we hear from people with narcolepsy. Um, we don't distinguish well between those two things either. And I think there it is a point that the drugs treat excessive daytime sleepiness, but they don't necessarily touch the fatigue. And so we have people who are on high doses of wake promoting substances and they're still saying, I'm exhausted. Uh, so obviously that's something that the pharmacological industry needs to take a closer look at. Because if the population high narcoleptic here for whom the drug is designed are still saying that we've got tiredness, well, obviously it's not, there's unmet needs. We've got somebody in the back who would like to join in. I, I wanted to add an experience of mine relative to that list. So while I, I'm a patient with sleep apnea and I have, could complain about all of those things, but I would elaborate that for me, one of the, the, the major underlying the anxieties is the realization that the sleep apnea is causing other problems for me. You know, the, the hypoxia for the brain, the, the effect on the cardiovascular system, um, it creates a frustration. I've tried, I, I've tried CPAP and mandibular advancement devices and positional therapies, and, um, and I keep trying. Um, and it doesn't seem to work. So it's uh, frustrating to realize not just that I'm tired, but that I'm hurting myself each night <laughs> by, by having these frequent uh, apneic episodes. Thank you. Let's look at some of the other symptoms. We've talked about fatigue and daytime sleepiness. Um, coming up very high in this particular setting are the difficulties with cognitive issues, thinking, concentrating, memory. Uh, and we heard from Dr. Burson why that might be the case. Our brain is not getting the full benefit of the restful sleep where all of the repair happens. And San Juanita talked about uh, the impact on her law practice and um, these symptoms coming on in the setting of trying to help a client and not only falling asleep but not having the ability to recall. What are some of the other cognitive issues that come up for people either uh, while they're doing well with their treatment or you know maybe beforehand? Erin. Hi. 
I know for me the difficulty with uh, sort of thinking and cognition and, and particularly memory was one of the scariest aspects of sleep apnea. Um, you know, uh, when I started developing other symptoms of sleep apnea, I, I really had difficulty recalling words. I would be very forgetful about bringing things with me or my kids would ask me to do something with them or help them with something. And, you know, if I didn't do it immediately, I would forget that they'd asked about it. So uh, it was really scary because, um, you know, I was a very academic person and I did a lot of very cerebral work at my job. And so that was a very, very difficult thing to realize I was losing some of the cognitive ability I had had before. And my therapy has really helped me with that, but uh, I think that's just a terrifying aspect of this that, um, you know, your short-term memory just starts to go and you can't concentrate the way that you used to or recall words the way you used to. So uh, that was one of the things that really prompted me to seek out treatment. Great, thank you for that. We saw a lot of comments in the open text in the survey about the impact on the ability to make decisions and to synthesize information in a way where you felt confident that you could make a decision in a, in a uh, you know, appropriate way. Um, anyone else want to share some of the cognitive impacts, uh, either short-term or over time? Let's think about, um, there are a few other things that we didn't include on this list that are part of uh, the survey questionnaire. How about pain? Um, we don't think of pain and sleep apnea going together, but certainly having spent the evening with a number of you, heard that come up time and again, and for you, Eugenia, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I don't know, back when I was 26 years old, I was in a car accident, and when I got checked out afterwards, they told me that I had degenerative bone disease. And, um, you know, being the athletic person that I was, I was like, yeah, okay, so what's the point? <laughs> and they said, well, it basically means your bones are breaking down, and it's going to be painful, and, you know, time goes by, you're going to have arthritis, and whatever else and you know so I said I'll worry about it when I get there but you know um, for years I was active as I said okay um, had very little problem well, every now and again you know lower back pain okay pregnancy did more tr gave me more trouble than anything else um, I was fine but then when the sleep apnea got involved um, it basically crippled me you know, um, that's the long and the short of it. The pain is what cripples you, okay? I, my knees, my whole spine at this point is affected. It's in my shoulder. I feel it now in my hands and my wrists. And, you know, that kind of thing from day to day. You know, I went from, like I said, jogging and playing softball and, you know, all of that to, you know, a good day for me now is today. You saw me, I haven't walked upstairs in over two years. First of all, two days ago I was in a wheelchair. I mean, that's the reality of life. And believe you me, when I get back to New York, I will probably be prostrate for a week. <laughs> <laughs> that's like today, oh yeah right? for 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 all of this little rowdy stuff you mm -hmm. see me doing <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm gonna pay for it in spades and it was worth it but that's the reality of it the pain sometimes is astronomical okay and i think back about you know when i was a kid and my grandmother and how she used to rock rubbing her knees you know and she'd say don't get old Okay, and now I find myself sitting watching TV or whatever, and I'm rocking and rubbing my <laughs> knees. Okay, and that's the reality of it. It's, it's, it's a reality, it's debilitating and it's disheartening 
because when you're an active person and you want to be active to be sidelined. I understand little kids now that I knew when I was little and how, why they always look sad to watch the rest of us playing sports and they had something wrong that they couldn't join us because now I'm that kid. Anybody else want to speak to pain, either the perception of pain being amplified because of sleep apnea or the pain itself? I would love to speak about pain. <laughs> um, I literally had a bilateral disc herniation when my daughter was about one, so it was about six months into my treatment. Uh, if I were to show you the MRI, I shouldn't even be walking right now. Um, I was on more different pharmaceuticals, both prescribed and self-medicating than I can count uh, over a long period of time. Uh, the sleep was so bad that my n sympathetic nervous system was just firing at all different hours of the night, all different hours of the day, and I was feeling sensations that they were telling me that was not there. Bottom line is, once I finally got hold of my sleep and treating it the right way, my so-called fibromyalgia, uh, my chronic pain, disappeared. And that is not known amongst a lot of people right now. Um, once the sleep was solidified and stabilized, the body reset. And what I needed to do as far as medication or management of it was just night and day. Um, I actually had a very good, well, young, trained neurosurgeon at the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis who looked at me and says, listen, there is no doubt you are a candidate for for artificial um, replacement surgery in, in your neck uh, for a disc. But let me tell you something, what you've got going on is, all, is something else. He goes, I can go fix your, your, your neck, but that's not gonna solve what's going on in your head. So he said, when you go back out to California, you start over, you get off the meds, and you rule out one variable at a time. So my words of wisdom, advice is that for a lot of us sleep apnea patients, it's so hard for us to figure out what the variable it is that we need to manage when it comes to the pain, when it comes to our work life, you have to look at one variable at a time and figure out if that's a positive for you, a negative, or neutral. If you try to change too many things, you'll never get a hold of what that one thing is. Now I could say it more eloquently, um, but I hope that helps explain sort of where I've learned how to manage my pain and, and issues of that nature. Great. We're going to come back to uh, management issues after we take a break for lunch, which we're just about ready to do. Um, uh, I know that there is a lot left to say, and as I started in the morning, it's hard to tease these, th this complicated set of symptoms and treatments and how they interrelate and comorbid conditions and all of the, the many manifestations apart into two neat buckets. So we'll continue some of the dialogue that we've started this morning when we come back after lunch and really focus in on the way that sleep apnea is treated kind of across the different disciplines uh, that Shelley outlined for us. She's gonna give us a, a short overview of the different ways and approaches to treating sleep apnea, and then all of you are gonna weigh in with your vast experience and the number of things that you've tried uh, in terms of, of managing your condition. But for right now, we invite you to take a bit of a break. We have a nice buffet lunch set up. Where's straight, straight out? Yep. And you can feel free to take your plates and things. There's a it's a beautiful day, at least it was in the morning time when we came in here. I hope our weather hasn't changed too much, but you can feel free to go outside. We do ask you to be back by 1245 so that we can again start with a broadcast for our online audience. And uh, thank you for your participation this morning and enjoy your lunch and we'll see you back at 1245.